they trudged on. Through smoke. Through fire. One foot before the other, lost in a dream of withered trees, thinking only of thirst. Remembering only to breathe. Months in this lost place. Sunless. Flowerless. Faithless. Chilled by that eternally whipping wind, they could only push forward until at last, in the choking distance, there came a break in the thicket. And with what wonder did their eyes fall upon that elusive milestone? With what fear of illusion did they stumble into that oasis in the wasteland? With what fragile belief did they fall to their knees at the sight of this phantom heaven? Episode 50, they cried through parched throats. And the great horn was brought forth to sound its note of celebration. And there was much dancing and laughter and red wine. And young Denny Boy was summoned from the revelry to place his trembling finger upon the sacred button. To roll intro! You're listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I got a song in my heart today, kids. And that song is... Love grows where my rosemary goes and nobody knows. Do you know that one? Do you know that song? It's a band called Edison Lighthouse, and I think that song was released in 1969, but became a worldwide hit in 1970. And I'll tell you something, it has been one of my favorite songs since I was old enough to recognize music. And it came back to me recently. Ken the Zen and I as part of the COVID come down, as part of music is gone, guess you better come up with something to do with yourselves. Ken the Zen and I started something called the Music Trivia League. And what this is, is head-to-head music trivia battles. And you can find this on the YouTube, all right? Look up Music Trivia League and do us a favor and subscribe to that, okay? We have, I don't know, six, seven, eight matches now posted on the YouTube. Head-to-head music trivia, and it's a lot of fun, and I say Ken the Zen and I created this, but this is primarily a Ken the Zen production. I am the co-host, but for some of the matches, I've been responsible for writing the round one, or perhaps round two in certain circumstances, questions. And the round one questions are all related to songs that have charted in the Billboard Top 10 from like 1958 up until the present day. And so for a match we recorded the other day, I was searching through songs that have been top 10 to make questions about them for round one. And I stumbled across Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes by Edison Lighthouse. Now look, when I was a child, when I was a small boy, I used to lean against my parents' massive stereo record player. I've talked about this on the show before. My parents had one of those, like, 1970s record players that was a piece of furniture. It was massive. It was the size of a desk and then another half of a desk on the end, right? With this, you flip up the lid. It's wood. There's a turntable in it, right? And there's speakers built right in. And there's, like, space where you can store your records. There's cupboards underneath. It's massive. It was a piece of furniture. It was like a focal point in a room. 
Back in the 70s, you had a piano and you had a record player, and they were more or less the same size. It took an army of strong men to move those things if you were moving house. So we had one of those, right? And we had a collection. My parents had a collection of 45s, okay? 45s. For you young kids who maybe you're into vinyl, maybe you're not, but 45s. Your singles used to come on your 45s, all right? They're your little ones, a little bit bigger than a compact disc. You don't remember compact discs either. Okay. You had your vinyl, it was on a 45, all right? You had an A side, you had a B side. And Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes by Edison Lighthouse, an English band from the late 60s was one of the songs they had. And somehow, five-year-old me got his hands on this record. Now, I've talked on recent episodes about formative music in my life. We talked about Loverboy. We talked about the Van Halen. But if you want to go back even further, picture little blonde me to steal from Douglas Copeland, practically albino. Yeah, I was like a red-haired baby. I don't know where that came from. But I was born, I think, with like red hair, and then it was like white by the time I was four or five years old. You can picture little me, pumpkin head, leaned up against the speaker on this piece of furniture, listening to Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, which was a huge international hit for this band Edison Lighthouse. It was the only one, by the way. I mean, they released other songs, but Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes was the one. And so I'm doing the questions for the latest trivia match, and I stumble across that song, which I had more or less forgotten about, okay? And it brings back a flood of memories, and I make it a question on the show. And one of the contestants actually got it right, by the way. Not going to tell you which one. You're going to have to tune in when that episode gets published. But I was reminded of that song, and I'm like, it must be on the YouTube and maybe I can see the band. When I was five years old, I didn't know it was Edison Lighthouse. I just knew I really liked that song. And if you know it, you know why. And if you don't know it, I'm going to put it in the show notes on my website. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com. And you'll be able to hear it there. And you may remember it, actually. If you're of a certain vintage, you've probably heard it on the radio. Or maybe you heard your parents play it, something like that. But it's one of these great, one Hit Wonders from the 60s. And there's a video, which I think is what I'll put in the show notes, of the band. It's kind of like an early 60s black and white music video, you know, way pre-MTV. Of the band, and they look exactly like you would expect, these 60s dudes with their curious hair. And then there's all, it's like in a club, right? And then there's all these girls dancing, and it's mini skirts and it's beehives, and it's the 60s, man. Like 69, 1970, and it'll bring a tear to your eye and a smile to your heart. Now, I get nostalgic for eras I didn't experience. I'm a history person. History affects me in a weird way, and you've heard me talk about that before. But I watched this video of Edison Lighthouse playing Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes. International, phenomenal smash hit. They're only one. And I see the girls dancing... And I see the band playing, and it just makes me feel happy, because it's a happy song, all right? We need happy songs right now. It's just one of those ebullient, happy 60s tunes. It's got a great verse, and it's got a great chorus. Now, I like the songs that have a catchy verse. Not a lot of songs have a catchy verse. You got a catchy verse, you got me hooked, my friend. And then you ramp it up in that chorus, and it's just a wonderful thing, and it makes me... Miss the 60s that I never experienced. And I watch it and I think, what great times they must have been. But then, you know, there's another part of me that's like, dude, the 60s weren't all, you know, mods and dance parties. Like the 60s. The 60s, man. We're talking about Khrushchev here. And we had presidential assassinations and we had legit threats of nuclear annihilation. Now, we came as close as we ever have. Cuban Missile Crisis, early 60s, Kennedy, they're turning the boats around. Now, apparently my father, who was in the Canadian Navy at the time, he was a radio operator, he was stationed somewhere, Churchill, Manitoba, something like that, actually received the message 
from, I don't know, NATO, the Americans, whatever. The message that the boats, the Russian boats carrying the nuclear warheads to Cuba, which is just a hop and a skip from mainland USA, by the way. Apparently, my father received the message that they were turning around and going back to Russia. And that was the closest we ever came to full-on nuclear war, my friends. And that was Kennedy. And that was the 60s. And then we had the Vietnam. And we had the civil rights protests. And we had a lot of civil unrest and social unrest and a spinning wheel of perception moving rapidly forward to a new kind of acceptance, man. But a lot of times that happens with pain, okay? Colossal sociological revolutions tend not to happen peacefully, all right? There tends to be turmoil around that, and that was the 60s. So I watch Edison Lighthouse playing Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, and it's all happy, and the girls are dancing, and they're beautiful, and the 60s are so rad, and you're waiting for Austin Powers to walk into the scene. It wasn't all like that, okay? But part of it was... And you watch that, and I watch that, and it makes me nostalgic for an era that I did not experience. But I guess you got to accept you were born when you were born, and you were meant to be here when you're here. So this is our time, kids, even us 47-year-olds, you know, the world is still our oyster. But I got that song in my heart, Edison Lighthouse, and you know, there's a apparently in the 2000s an edition of that band still playing. And you can go to their website, and they don't look like really hip 60s mod revolutionaries anymore. They look like the Oak Ridge Boys, kind of. But, you know, a, a version of that still exists. But that song was sung by a cat called Tony Burroughs, and he did not last long in Edison Lighthouse. So what comes after that was inconsequential to the charts and is inconsequential to me. But that is a formative tune, man. And I was reintroduced to it this week, and it's like rediscovering a long-lost friend. So think about the music you used to love when you were five years old. And you leaned up against your parents' record player that was the size of a piece of furniture. And you listened to their 45s. And my parents must have been hip cats at some point, man. Because they had that 45, and they had the Elvis 45. They had Mess of Blues. That was another formative song for me. Maybe it was my older sisters. I don't know. Somebody had these 45s, man. And that one just made me feel happy. And if you listen to that song, you can't help but feel happy. It's a great tune, man. And I was excited to be reintroduced to that. Now, I have a, a weird thing, you know, because the band was originally called Edison Lighthouse, okay? And then at some point in time, I read this, did a little research, they changed their name to just Edison. And I think the folks in the Canadian band Lighthouse were probably glad that they did. Because we didn't need, like, Lighthouse X. Or Lighthouse BC. And if you're into the modern rock music, you'll know that's a reference to Bush. Having to change their name to Bush X temporarily, I believe, for the North American market over a trademark dispute over the name Bush. And Ghost had to be Ghost BC here in North America for a while over the same issue. But the good people of Edison Lighthouse and Lighthouse managed to, I don't know if they ever came in conflict, but if they did, they worked it out. Now I have a weird connection to Lighthouse, okay? Strange one. So several years ago, not several, like four maybe, uh, my former band Hiroshima Hearts was recording... Uh, a six-song EP called Bone Music, which you can still find out there in the world. And if you go to my website, you'll find a couple of music videos for songs from that record, for Four Steps Down and for Spend Your Money. And I'm pleased to tell you that Four Steps Down was a song that I brought into the band, at least the rudimentary guitar riffs and verse structure for it. And then the rest of the band filled it in for me, made it a song. Is uh, probably the only song that we all wrote really together, which is cool. But you find music videos for that song, it doesn't matter. We were recording Bone Music, and the studio that we were recording at was also set to be host to a documentary about Skip Prokop, who uh, is a Canadian drumming legend and was the drummer in Lighthouse. 
And for atmosphere, for mood, for background, they were going to shoot Skip being interviewed in this space. And they wanted something in the background that was drummy. And as my drums were set up for the recording, my YC drum kit, YC Drum Company, Canadian Custom Drums, and the best you can get, Jordan Gauthier, the proprietor of that company, was a guest on my show early, early on. You can go back and find that. Very inspiring interview. So apparently there exists a documentary about Skip Prokop where you can see Skip being interviewed and find my drum set in the background. I have not seen this, but it all comes full circle, man. From Edison Lighthouse, Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes, to Skip Prokop of Lighthouse, to My Drums, to Jordan Goche being on this podcast. And isn't that enough? I should shut it off right now. 14 minutes, a weird connection to the music world, and a couple of fun stories. Thank you! Good night! Look, this is episode number 50, and in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you why that matters. But before we get to that, I got to drop in a couple of addendums, a couple of additional bits, an epilogue, if you want, to episode 48, which was the triumphant return. Okay, now, I know you tuned in because the millions did all around the world. And we talked about Van Halen and ACDC and a bunch of stuff, and I got some feedback. Got railroaded a bit over the Van Hagar. Now, I was not saying that Van Hagar wasn't good, okay? I was saying, for me, Van Halen, the Van Halen, the iconic Van Halen, is the Roth Van Halen of the late 70s, early 80s, okay? But I'm not saying that, taken on its own merit, Van Hagar was not a good band. Was a good band. 5150, great record. You got your hot summer nights, you know? And you got the best of both worlds, which is one of my favorite Van Halen songs, by the way. Love that riff, and I probably love that tune because it sounds like something David Lee Roth might have been involved in before his departure. It feels like a Roth song. Sounds like a Van Hagar tune. I feel like the production was a little bit different when it came around to them releasing records, but it felt like a Roth song to me, so maybe that's why I like it. But that that riff, man, dun 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 dun, dun that's you can't help but dance, man. If you're a rock music guy or a girl, can't help but dance to that. And that's a great tune. And Van Hagar had a bunch of great tunes. Right now is great. Pound Cake is great. They released some really good records. Not saying Van Hagar is not good. But I gotta ask you something, okay? If there had never been a 1970s, early 80s Van Halen, fronted by Diamond David Lee Roth, if there had never been that band, right? And the first thing we ever heard from the entity called Van Halen was 5150, was Van Hagar, was Sammy Hagar's new band, because that's kind of how it might have been billed, man. Sammy Hagar's new band. Not Van Halen with a new singer, but Sammy Hagar's new band with this guitar player, Eddie Van Halen. If that's all we knew, all right, and they released their records and they had their hits, why can't this be love, etc., etc.? Would Van Halen be remembered as an icon? as one of the great, revolutionary, memorable, iconic rock bands of all time? Or would they be remembered as a good band from the 80s that had some hit songs? I ask you, what comes to mind when you picture Van Halen? And if there had never been Diamond Dave... Would you picture Van Halen? Would it carry the same weight? Would it carry the same cachet? Would it carry the same aura as it does now had there never been a Diamond David Lee Roth? 
Just putting that out there. Now, something I forgot to mention on the last episode, on the Triumphant Return episode, which is important, is there's a fabulous book written by a cat called Noel Monk. Now, Noel Monk was Van Halen's manager in the Roth heyday, all right, from Backyard Parties, mid-70s, all the way up to 1984, and Diamond Dave's passed out in the bathroom on Coke and booze, all right? All the way from, you know, the young, forming Van Halen, Mammoth. The Van Halen brothers were in Mammoth, and then they formed Van Halen. All the way up to Hot for Teacher, man. All the way up to when David Lee Ross split. Noel Monk was the manager. Now, I gather he was under some sort of publication ban. All right, they let Noel Monk go. They parted ways at a certain point. And part of the parting was, dude, you can't spill the beans for 25 years or something like that. So if we do the math, like, I don't know, 1990, mid-80s, up to sort of like 2016, 17, 18. Noel Monk released this book called Running with the Devil, and it was his side, his view, his perspective on the Van Halen story. And I got to tell you, what a freaking great book. What a freaking great book, man. Fascinating read. This dude has... I mean, he was there from the beginning, man. He saw it all. And I don't know, the Van Halen folks might agree or disagree on his take on things, on how he saw it unfold. But it's an amazing book, man. If you want to get inside the phenomenon, if you want to see how this happened and the sort of crazy roller coaster ride these guys were on and how they didn't make any money for a long time. There was like money happening, but Van Halen guys weren't making it. You know, and then how things went down with Michael Anthony and how things went down with Roth. And the whole thing is a really compelling read, man. And I read it on the beach one time, Mexico or someplace. And I couldn't put the thing down, man. Proper page turner, man. You know what I mean? So if you're a Van Halen person and you have not read Running with the Devil by Noel Monk, I'm going to tell you to go out there and find it at your local library, or perhaps on Amazon, if you're a book buyer. It's a great read, man. Even if you're not a Van Halen person, you're just really interested in compelling human stories. If you're a rock music fan, or an 80s music fan, or somebody who's just generally interested in the business of music, how stars are made, how bands go from backyard parties in Pasadena, California, to playing stadiums, how that happens, go read this book, man. And uh, seriously, for Van Halen fans, it's a must. Not going to say it's a must. I know I said it. Drives me nuts when I'm watching something and it says, must see TV. You must see this. No, you mustn't see it. You don't have to. Life will go on if you don't read Noel Monk's book. But if you're looking for something to read, I highly recommend it because it's a fascinating story. Very, very well presented. Real page turner and the inside scoop man from a guy who was there in a position of authority, a guy who was in the inner circle. The manager becomes, you know, the fifth member of the band, okay? And I don't just mean that symbolically, like takes a fifth of the money, takes a fifth of the revenue, fifth member of the band. So this guy was behind closed doors. This guy was in on the decisions. This guy made a lot of the decisions, okay? Fascinating read, Running with the Devil by Noel Monk. Go look it up and you will not be disappointed. Now I got another addendum I gotta make. Something I gotta tip you off to, you know, because we talked about the new Striper record and I talked about Michael Sweet and how his voice has held up bewilderingly from the 80s. And you listen to this dude at 60, belting out songs like it was 1984 again. And I said, that's a rare thing. And it is a rare thing. But it's not an exclusive thing. I had another very pleasant surprise, a very pleasant vocal surprise recently. When I was scouring the internet, 
and I was looking for music and live footage of a band called MSG. Do you know MSG? Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, Michael Shanker Group. And you would be wrong, sir. Because what I'm actually talking about is Macaulay Shanker Group, okay? Now, this is a version of MSG, Michael Shanker Group. Now, you probably know Michael Shanker if you're listening to this show. Michael Shanker, guitar legend, heavy metal pioneer, was a, like an early member of the Scorpions and then is primarily known for being the lead player in UFO in a variety of different stints off and on. But he also had like a solo band thing called the Michael Shanker Group. But there was a certain point in the 80s where uh, he had been through like the singers and whatever and he'd recruit different players and make an album and whatever. And that was MSG and that's great. There's a certain point where he recruited a singer called Robin McCauley, all right? And they did a couple of records under the MSG label, but the M became Macaulay. So it was Macaulay Shanker Group, Robin Macaulay and Michael Shanker. And they put out a couple of great records, man. All right, you got to go. If you're an 80s person, if you're a rock and roll person, if you're one of the people who went and checked out Dirty Looks and you're out there, I know you are because you wrote and told me you did it. Go check out Macaulay Shanker Group, all right? Check out the Perfect Timing record and check out Save Yourself. Those are the kind of the two, the two ones, right? Perfect Timing, 1987, Save Yourself, 1989. Macaulay Shanker Group, MSG. This is Robin Macaulay singing. Now, MSG dropped a couple of my favorite songs of the entire 80s rock era. One is called Love Is Not A Game. Go watch the video. It's fun. It's got roller derby. You like roller derby, don't you? I don't understand Roller Derby, but it looks good in a video, all right? And I forgot about this other tune that's called Anytime. It's described as a, a power ballad. I don't know if ballad is right. Uh, it's more of a lighter hard rock song to me. But I had forgotten about Anytime, and I was like on a YouTube deep dive recently. Did you ever have this happen? Did you ever have a song where you knew you liked it 30 years ago? You knew it was a song you liked... And then you discovered it 30 years later again, and you're like, this is one of my favorite songs ever. Like, I was not giving this thing enough weight. I was not giving this thing enough cred. I was not giving this thing enough status, you know, in my pantheon. So there's this song, Anytime, by MSG, Macaulay Shanker Group. Wonderful tune. And these are great hard rock tunes, man. They were part of the hair metal kind of scene. And if you've checked out Dirty Looks and Britney Fox and some of the other stuff I recommended, you know that there's good music to be found in that scene. And MSG is one of the bands you should be listening to. And so I was looking for the studio version of Anytime, right? And it's great. And I'm listening to it and I'm playing drums to it. And I'm like, oh, this song is great. I love this tune. How did I forget this tune? But you forget them, man, over time. But then there's like the YouTube does the, you know, also check out or, or up next. And it was something, something that strikes terror into the heart, okay? When you see that you're banned from 30 years ago and it says, MSG Anytime Live 2018, something like that, right? And you go, oh, man, do I want to, do I, do I want to, Robin McCauley was a great singer back in the 80s, man. Do I, do I want to put myself through this? Do I want to hear this two steps lower in key? Do I want to hear him not be able to do this? He's in his 60s. Like, uh, you know, because you get burned. All right, I've been burned. I've been burned a few times. You know, you call up that dude who was all the rage, was all the pinup. Even the girls had his picture in the locker, right, in 1987. And then you hear him in 2014 or 18 or something like that, and you go, oh, how sad is that? You never want your heroes to be sad. You know what I mean? But I clicked on it, man. I clicked on, I will put this in the show notes as well. I clicked on Robin McCauley singing Anytime in, I think it was 17 or 18, something like that, in Montreal. How did I not know about this? And it was perfect, man. Robin McCauley, 60 years old, and just nailed it. And it's really fun to listen to audiences when they see this happen. Because they have the same feelings, I think, you know? I mean, it's, it's just versions of me who are in the crowd, and they see Robin McCauley come out, the MSG kind of reunion thing. 
and they see him stepping up to sing and they're like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go, man. Mark Marin, a couple specials ago, had a commentary and had a bit about going to see the Rolling Stones play. It's like before the show comes up, he's in the middle of the crowd and he's looking around like, ah, I don't know how this is going to go, everybody. I don't know how this is going to be, all right? Let's temper our expectations. So you see Robin McCauley step up and he's about to sing and he opens his mouth and it's Robin McCauley, man. Robin McCauley, as Michael Schenker says in his German accent. And it's perfect. It's beautiful. And that dude always had a great voice, man. And he still does in the modern era. And it warms your cockles, man. It's great when you see these guys still do it. So I was talking about singers who still have it. Robin McCauley is one of them. Michael Sweet is one of them. Those are the addendums to the triumphant return. And now we're going to have a little celebration, kids. But first, we're going to dance. Yes, episode 5050, episode 50 of the John Huff Podcast. Now, that's a milestone. All right, that's a milestone for anyone. I read a statistic somewhere that says most podcasts, I don't have the exact number here, all right? I'm going to ballpark it, but it's something like most podcasts burn out at eight episodes or something like that. Or 10 or 11 or 9 or something like that. But it's a low number because you jump into this with full-on enthusiasm. And then nobody listens to your show. And then you realize, man, this takes a lot of time to edit. Man, this is a lot of work. Why is Spotify not offering me a $10 million a year deal? This is bogus, man. We're out of here. And most shows flame out. So reaching episode 50... Even though we took the long way, and we had a substantial hiatus, getting to episode 50 is a milestone, and it's worth celebrating. But there's an extra layer, all right? It runs a little deeper this time, because when I started this thing, lo, these many months ago, 2018, I think it was, I said to myself, I'm going to shoot for 50 episodes, okay? And then we're going to get there, and then we'll see if we proceed from that point. Because I've been down this road, kids. I've had blogs, I've done different things, and very easy to start these things. Very, very difficult sometimes to keep them going, because everything is more work than you thought it was going to be. You know, when I had the London Groove Machine blog, I ran that for maybe three years, posting up interviews, posting up articles, trying to give spotlight to new music. Pile of work, not a lot of response. And you wonder at a certain point what's worth it and what isn't. So I went into this, the John Huff podcast, thinking we'll go 50 episodes. And at the time, I thought that would be a year, you know, Uh, because I thought I'd bang one out every week and we'd do it for a year because usually in my case, things start to taper off after about a year, lose my enthusiasms, lose my energy for it. But I thought I can get 50 because you need a sample size, right? You can't flame out after five episodes. Like nobody's listening. Who cares? You got to have a track record, all right? You got to give it a chance to snowball. You need a little momentum there, right? Starts as a little snowflake, add another snowflake, roll, 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 roll down the hill, gathers momentum, but you got to give it time to do that, okay? So I said we'll do 50 episodes, and here we are. Somehow, didn't look like we were going to make it, because I stopped at 47, and the COVID happened, and I went into hiding, went into hermit mode, Thought it might not come back, and it didn't sit super well with me because I knew I had made a pledge to myself to do 50 episodes. So I'm glad to say we're back and we've come this far. But where are we? Because this show that I'm doing right now bears almost no resemblance to episode number one. It's got same theme music, got same outro-ish. 
but the content of the show is utterly different. Now, when I started this thing, I started off doing interviews, right? Because I've always done interviews, and that tends to be what podcasts are. And then 12 or 13 episodes in, I started adding just slightly longer intros to things. A little bit off the cuff, a little bit colloquial, a little bit folksy. You know George Bush? A little bit folksy there? You want a president you can go with go for beer with, you know? You want a president you can sit down with. George Bush. Started George Bush it a little bit, and I liked it. You know, but I had some cognitive dissonance because I launched this thing as an interview show and I felt obligated to keep that going. But at a certain point, I was having trouble finding interviews and I needed to put out an episode and I did a solo sode. And in retrospect, that makes such perfect sense. I don't listen to a lot of interview shows, kids. Not regularly. I'll listen if I am interested in the guest that pops up on Rogan, maybe, rarely, but sometimes, or Marin's podcast or something like that. I don't listen to a lot of interview shows. I listen to a lot of solo shows. I listen to a lot of personality podcasts. Your Roths and your Burrs and your Jim Fortins and some of these guys. So, you know, over time... This began to morph into more of a solo show, and I had an affirmation. I had several affirmations with episode 48, Triumphant Return, Gandalf, all that stuff that resonated with people, you know? And, I mean, I had praise from corners that surprised me. I got a message from... This still blows me away when I get a message from Monty Colvin. Now, Monty Colvin... Had 17-year-old John, 18-year-old John, known that one day he'd be getting friendly emails from Monty Colvin, he probably would have passed out. Because to 17-year-old John, listening to music on the tape deck in his K-car, Monty Colvin was the bass player and occasional lead singer and probably lead songwriter of the band Galactic Cowboys, Geffen Records. One of my favorite bands of all time, the Galactic Cowboys. And Monty was the bass player in that band. And you fast forward 10 years from 1990 to 2000, internet technology, the interactive web, where you could email folks. And I began a correspondence with Monty, who was a Look, dude, a rock star to me, rock hero, and he is a rock star and a rock hero, even if you're not into or familiar with the Galactic Cowboys, and if you're into fabulous heavy metal music underneath amazing four-part vocal harmonies and a band that really slays live, you should be listening to Galactic Cowboys, folks. And they're still around, by the way. I dropped a record in 2017. Not the point. Point is, I got a message from Monty after listening to Triumphant Return, which said just how good and natural and engaging and entertaining that was. And that also warms the cockles, my friends. I'm still blown away that I'm getting messages from Monty Colvin. I don't know what that's like for you. I don't know what the parallel is. I don't know what the parallel is. But think of when you were 17 and you're in a there was a band that you were super duper into. And they were on a major label and they were rock stars. And fast forward, I don't know, I guess it's 30 years, and you're getting colloquial, friendly messages from the bass player in that band. And maybe your mind gets warped a little bit. Maybe you get a little bit mind blown. And I still am, Monty, when I get a message from you, when I see that pop up in my inbox. Monty has a fabulous podcast of his own called Monty's Rockcast, and that is a solo rockcast. And it's one of the ones that I listen to and I tell people. This, when I talk about solo podcasts that work and are professionally done and are entertaining, Monty's Rockcast is one of them. And he's one of the pioneers, man. That show has been around for like a decade. Before all of your podcast platforms and all that stuff, Monty was doing the Rockcast where he talks about all kinds of modern and classic metal and rock music. 
and he tells road stories from when Galactic Cowboys were touring with the likes of Dream Theater and Anthrax and that kind of stuff. And it's all great and entertaining. Monty's Rockcast. If you're a rock or metal guy and you like comedy, go listen to Monty's Rockcast because it's a great podcast that has all of that. Super well produced, very slick, and Monty is the consummate host with an encyclopedic-ish knowledge of classic and modern rock music. So go listen to the Rockcast. But I got a message from Monty saying, dude, that episode was really great. Very natural, very smooth, very engaging, very compelling. And I got that message from a bunch of people, which was very heartwarming for me because I was reluctant to put that episode out, man. I still feel a little bit weird doing solo podcasts, but you know, solo podcasts is what I like. Solo podcasts is what I listen to. And there's a way to do this. That is not just an ego trip, all right? Now, that's where the cognitive dissonance comes in, and I'm trying to work that out. But I like doing the solo things, and the more I think about it, the more sense it makes. And, you know, there's a temptation to try to make this about something super-duper elevated, right? Now, this show from its beginning has been about trying to inspire people, and I've brought in guests who are making it in the music business, who are publishing novels, who are building their own fitness business or yoga businesses, doing wellness things, doing things that it's possible for you to do too, man. Possible for me to do. I wanted to bring in the evidence that things are possible. And I think I've done that, you know, for whatever it's been, 35 or something episodes of interviews with people like that, like Danny Miles and Jordan Goche and and Lynn Hansen and Sarah Tomac, who drums for Steven Tyler, for crying out loud, and Jason Tate, and what, what an amazing experience that was. It's been fabulous. But I'll tell you something, kids. I was thinking about what to do with this show, and I was thinking about where to go with it as we now crest the hill, Hill 50. And there was a post on Facebook a couple weeks ago by a friend of mine. And the friend said simply, I'm really lonely. All right. Now, this is COVID, okay? This is COVID. This is semi isolation. This is not being able to live the kind of social life that we're used to living. And you know, some people live alone. A lot of people live alone. I'm fortunate to be married and I don't live alone. But, you know, there are people out there who are lonely. And that struck a nerve with me. Because it took me back to the days when I was a student. And when I was in university, taking English and history, because I wanted to be Dead Poet Society, wanted to be Robin Williams, intended to be a high school teacher, and have the credentials to do that, by the way. But back in those days, I didn't, I didn't go out. All right. I, I was a diligent-ish student by my standards still deeply into the church scene. So I didn't go out, you know, my roommates Friday, Saturday night, they'd pack up and they'd be gone, you know, off to meet women, off to meet all the women, my roommates. Don't remember any women coming home with them, but off they went. And you got to admire that kind of pluck, kids. You got to admire that determination. Off they went, always came home alone. But while they were off there trying to not come home alone, I was home alone. Friday night, Saturday night, a lot of times on Sunday night. Now, I'm doing English and history, okay? I don't know. If you've not done those degrees, I can't make you understand how much reading that is. And we're talking early to mid-90s here, folks, okay? I can't go on the YouTube and get the synopsis, you know what I'm saying? So you got a Shakespeare course and you got a novel course and you got one of those due each week. Got to read a novel, got to read a Shakespeare. And by the way, you got to read 50 pages of maritime economics and also some Scottish history. <laughs> and there's five papers to write and midterms are coming. So there's a lot to do, man. So I'd be stuck in my room Friday night, Saturday night alone because I didn't really have a social life. I wasn't into the bar scene. You know, it wasn't for me. And I would get lonely too, man. 
I can admit it now. Now, I know what you're thinking. You look at the caricature that Denny drew of me. You look at the pictures of me on Facebook. You think, well, that guy was never lonely. That guy always had all the people around. How could he not have been super duper popular, the big man on campus? I was not, okay? And I was lonely a lot. And the way to assuage that, the way to draw some comfort, the way to pull some people into my little space, my room, was the talk radio. You know? I did my first year in, in, at the University of Windsor, and I was, I was living in a residence there that was something akin to Lord of the Flies, Lord of the Cockroaches, if you look closely enough. And I had a window looking out over the Ambassador Bridge and Detroit, where we could watch the fires on Devil's Night and Halloween. Always a good time. And it was the same deal, man. Same deal when I was in res, you know? The, the lads would get on the bus and go downtown to meet the women. I'd be home, man. So it was there. I transferred to a different university for the rest of my degree. That doesn't matter. But I would tune in the talk radio on Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night sometimes. And I'd just listen to the voices, man. And it was like having somebody with me. It was just a little bit less lonely. And when I saw this post on Facebook that says I'm lonely, the COVID's got me lonely, I thought, you know, I want to inspire people. I want this show to be something people listen to and they walk away thinking, I can do this. They walk away thinking, whatever it is that's the dream, I can handle it. You know, it's possible for me. And I still want that. And I'm still going to pump your tires, man. I'm still going to bring that to you. But you know, it's just as valid, it's just as legitimate a purpose for this show to be where somebody can turn when they're lonely. You know what I mean? This can be talk radio, man. We live in a time where the tools and the platforms and the vehicles exist for all of us to be talk radio. You know, talk radio was a friend of mine back in those days. Talk radio remains that to a certain extent. And now I feel inside like if I can just provide an hour where somebody doesn't have to be alone, that's not such a bad thing, man. And that's not a bad reason to have a podcast, you know? And so as we sit here on episode 50, I can be for you, maybe, that voice in the night. Now, there was a band in the 80s called Mass. Another hair metal band. You're going to get your full dose, man. You're going to get your full volume. You're going to get your full quotient of the hair metal on this program. Because I ain't shy about it, man. And there was a period of time in the 90s when I was, man. You had to go underground, all right? You were a little bit blacklisted if you were a hair metal guy. But now I'm 47 years old, and my long hair, my hair metal hair, is turning gray. And I don't care anymore. I'm a proud fire of that flag. And there was a band called Mass, late 80s. Mass is still around, incidentally. But the heyday, such as it was, for Mass late 80s, and they released a record called Voices in the Night, and the, and the title track might put that in the show notes on my website, john-huff.com. Great tune, and it was, uh, the record was actually produced by Michael Sweet of Striper, so there's your connection. Mass, Voices in the Night, and I thought maybe this show can be the voice in the night too. Keep you company, man. Keep you interested. Give you another human being to listen to, because if you can hear this, you are the revolution. So we're here on episode 50, and I want to thank you, gentle listener, for being here this long with me. You know, I've received nothing but encouragement and support from people all over the world, quite literally. I'm lucky enough to have made friendships with a lot of people in Europe and in the States and, of course, all across Canada. And I so appreciate when you guys tell me I'm doing a good job or when you leave a review on the Apple 
that says, I really like this show, you should listen to it. And I'm not looking for my tires to be pumped, but, you know, sometimes you put this stuff out into a vacuum and it's hard to know if it's accomplishing anything at all. And I'm just as insecure as anybody, man. That's what this is all about, my own insecurities, you know? But sometimes you gotta jump in, and I know that things have changed. I know that we have changed format utterly since the beginning, but that's what happens. You know, a lot of people have an idea to do a thing and they hesitate and hesitate and hesitate because they don't think they can do it perfectly or they don't know exactly what it should be or what they want it to be, whether that's a podcast or writing music or a piece of art or a piece of writing or poetry or making a movie, whatever. And, you know, I could have sat there, I did sit there for years and years not making the podcast because I wasn't sure about a bunch of stuff. Not going to bore you with that. But at a certain point, you got to jump in, man. Whatever it is you want to do, it ain't going to be perfect right away. You go back and listen to my early episodes, you're like, oh, that's quaint. And that's what I wanted. I wanted it to be quaint in the beginning so that we could get to episode 50 and look back and say, we've made progress, man. Now, I wasn't counting on a full format change. I wasn't counting on me yakking at you for an hour. But I wanted it to be better. I wanted it to sound better. I wanted the delivery to be more smooth, you know. I wanted the everything to just be better. And I knew those first episodes weren't going to be great. Because how could they be? Because this is a new format. This is me jumping into something I've never did, done before. And if you're standing on the precipice, if you're standing on the edge of something that you're not sure how to do, and you're afraid to do it poorly, jump! Jump, man. Not if you're on the edge of a building right now, thinking about jumping or not jumping, and you were lonely, and you plugged into me to have a voice beside you. Don't jump! But if you're on the edge of a creative pursuit, if you're afraid to try something because you don't know if it'll be any good, do it and keep doing it. Things get better. Things evolve. Things develop their own idiom. I need to escape in my own idiom. Look, that's what I had to do. I had no freaking idea. I had no idea that we would roll around to 50 and it'd just be me talking to you. Never saw that in the cards, man. But I like it, and I think it works. And I never would have known that had I not taken the first step through the fear of looking ridiculous, through the fear of not doing well, through the fear of nobody listening, through the fear of being embarrassed and humiliated. If you don't step through that fear, you don't get to episode 50, where you still might be embarrassed and humiliated. But it's all an evolution, man. But the evolution needs a creator. Oh, he's not going there. Tell me he's not going there. Evolution versus creation. I'm just going to let you dance around with that a little bit in your own head. But the evolution can't happen if nothing starts, you know? If the ball doesn't roll, it can't grow, man. So if you're hesitant to do a thing, just do the thing. Be bad at it. I was bad at it. I'm probably still bad at it. I mean, solo episodes, this is like seven or eight of them. This is brand new, man. I'm just a little baby. Just a little baby over here learning how to do this. But let this be the evidence that if you keep going, things can get better. Things can shake down. You can begin to understand how you want to do a thing. How to make it better. How it floats for you. How it works for you. I had no idea a year and a half ago, whatever it was, when I started this thing, that I could do a solo podcast, that that was even a possibility, and that I could do it perhaps reasonably well by some people's estimation. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't taken the steps to begin, and begin maybe down the wrong trajectory. But is it the wrong trajectory if it leads to where we are now? It was the path to take. So take the step, kids. Whatever it is you want to do, Whatever it is you're afraid to try, take the step. Follow it. See where it goes. Listen to your intuition. Watch the nudges. See what floats. Eventually, even if you know, you're know you not sure how you want it to go, it will shape itself. 
it will teach you what it wants to be. And then you follow it and it will pick up the essence of you and become, you know, whatever it wants to be. I'm not articulating this well at all because we're over 50 minutes and I'm starting to burn out. All I'm saying is do the thing, okay? Take a step. You can change course. You can alter things. You can change your style. You can change your flavor. You can change your genre. But begin the thing. Because if you don't begin the thing, you can't go through the process it takes to get to where the thing wants to be. And I had other stuff I want to talk about. But I ain't going to do it. Because this is getting too long. And one of the things I got to do is... You know, insert a little brevity into these things. I hope you've hung with me this long, kids. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the kind of support that it takes to get me here to this milestone of 50 episodes, which I said from the beginning is what I want to get to. And now, I guess you're going to have to tune in next week to see if we stop here or if we keep going. I hope the COVID hasn't got you down. Hope your life's okay. Hope you're thinking positive thoughts. Hope you're looking for creative outlets. I hope you're ready to step through the fear into whatever it is that your soul's calling you to do, man. Thank you again. Happy 50th, everyone. And I will, perhaps, catch you on the next one. Bye for now. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. If you want to know more about the program, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com and click on podcast. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. If you're a Twitter person, you can find me at at J.W.S. Huff. No matter where you listen to the show, please do me a big, big favor and leave a rating and review. Preferably a positive one. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you and remember... Good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. Never forget her and nobody knows like me. Yeah. Huh.